Hello. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here in the first place, and thank you for the introduction. Um, to be honest, um, uh, when I came to choose this subject, um, at first I was thinking of doing some work on Rome. I'm also doing a lot of research on Rome at the moment. Um, but then I decided to do Valletta for a very simple reason. Um, in Europe we have this uh, European capital of culture thing and Valletta happens to be a European capital of culture this year so I tried to sort of uh, just wanted to put Valletta in the background. I chose the period of the Knights of St. John um, for a very basic reason. It is the Knights of St. John who built Valletta. There was no such thing as Valletta before the Knights of St. John and we're talking of the 16th century. Um, um, it is very, very particularly placed. Um, it is also um, meant to be the convent of the Knights of St. John. The, the Knights of St. John are essentially monks, but they are warrior monks. They're not like any other monks. So uh, it's a, an ambivalent situation because usually we associate monks with peace, with prayer. And these guys prayed, but they also fought. So <laughs> this, is the, this, is, this is the reason why I uh, thought of uh, giving you a background to this. Um, one thing is certain that unless um, uh, uh, had the knights, rather, had the knights not built Valletta, not established themselves there, nowadays the little republic now, or the little state of Malta, I believe, would not have existed. It would have been something completely different. And so they practically cre created a state simply because they were knights, they were monks, but they also came from the nobility of Europe and they were very rich indeed. They, came, they were very, very rich and they spent a lot of money on their island state, out of their own pockets. So you can imagine um, why it was possible for these people to leave so many treasures in Valletta. Um, so um, I called it a catalyst in the central Mediterranean because um, Valletta functioned very much as a catalyst um, in the 17th century in particular, in the, in the 1600s. In the 1600s, Valletta was um, a, or Malta uh, under the Knights, was very much a minor power in the Mediterranean. And it, it did very well with places like the Republic of Genoa, the Republic of Venice, uh, the Kingdom of Sicily, so Central Mediterranean, with Algiers. So it was very highly appreciated, including highly appreciated the training that people obtained with the navy of the knights by someone like the King of France. The King of France was all the time encouraging the French nobility to train with the knights of Malta on their vessels, that is, on their ships. So that explains a lot of things. So. Uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, the Mediterranean uh, was described as a battleground between the two great powers of Catholic Spain in the west and the Muslim Ottoman Empire in the east. It was an age during which these two great empires, supported by their respective allies, gave evidence of their formidable might. The, 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 the emp these two empires actually, they were big, but they, for example, Spain had uh, had practically Central and South America, Latin America. Um, the Ottoman Empire at the time was extending its, um, uh, its territories and fighting especially against Persia all the time. They were all the time fighting the Persians and also the Russians. So it was a, they were two very big important empires. Now before the rise of the Habsburg kings, Charles V and Philip II of Spain, the Catholic kings of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, who were responsible for the unification of Spain, played a vital, as vital a part in, the create, in, the, in creating the Spanish Empire. They were responsible for the establishment of various Christian enclaves along the North African coast, stretching from Morocco to Tripoli, Libya. In fact, still to this day, um, Spain still has a couple of enclaves, Ceuta and Melilla, if I am not right, if I am not wrong. Still to this day, there are Spanish enclaves in North Africa, along the Moroccan coast. 
Likewise, uh, the Ottoman Sultans, after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, were intent in expelling the remaining satellite territories of the Christian minor powers, particularly Venice. And by 1522, they managed to expunge the Knight Hospitallers of St. John from, uh, from Rhodes and its territories in the Dodecanese and the tip of Anatolia. Now, when in 1530, Emperor Charles V granted the Maltese Islands as a fief of the Hospitaller Order of St. John, the old isolation of Malta, it was a, a remote part of the Kingdom of Sicily, Sicily was a kingdom at the time, melted into thin air. The terms offered by the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor were so generous that with time, the order turned the island into a veritable sovereign state in all senses of the word. Various categories of foreigners attracted by good work opportunities settled in Malta, importing social, cultural, and ideological components which were different from those originally predominating in the island. It may be said that the Ottoman siege of Malta of 1565 brought about a radical transformation to life in the island. Basically, the Ottomans had been attacking the islands, especially there was a very important attack in 1551, a siege actually, which led to the taking away into slavery of the whole population of an island nearby to Malta, Gozo, all the population practically, except for the main and the, uh, the elderly, those people who are worthless in slavery terms. And so you, don't, you can't really send them to row on the galleys or to do any domestic service or to do anything else. Those were left behind, but the rest were taken away. And that was a, uh, it was a, a terrible thing um, for the people of the time. However, this 1565 siege was thought to be even much worse than that because they, the, the, the locals, the, the, the islanders in particular, and the knights themselves thought that they were no match and that somehow or other the island would fall. In reality, it did not. It did not for a simple reason that um, uh, you may be aware that galleys only, the Mediterranean only um, were used for six months of the year. In other words, um, spring and summer. At the end of summer, at this time of the year, you know, first week of September, when the rough seas uh, the Gregate seas, uh, uh, winds, we call them, um, and you know, the bad winds and, 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 and bad weather may come along. I mean, we, we can have very rough seas and rough weather at that time. So people start, you know, lifting anything, lifting even sieges, and that is exactly what happened. Due to the rough weather, I mean, there was shortage of water, there was shortage of everything, uh, the Ottomans decided to leave. But that was a victory for the people of the island, <laughs> because they were saved. It's important to say that the, the, the people who were defending were approximately one-fourth of the attackers on the whole. So that was a one-to-four thing. It was almost impossible to win. So anyway, the, the, this break uh, with the past manifested itself in all le uh, levels. In fact, immediately after the siege, increased migration to Sicily they start to migrate to Sicily. Coupled with the continual evacuation of the countryside by a peasant attracted to city life, led to extensive rural depopulation. In other words, the, the, many Maltese uh, from the villages moved out of them. The widespread destruction of houses, fields, livestock, changed the villages physically, and new buildings and churches in a different site were set up after the siege. The new system, uh, which was developed by the Knights, created a dual social structure that develops immediately after the Knights set foot on Malta and it becomes even more apparent after the siege of 1565 and the building of Valletta. In fact, Valletta, the foundation stone, um, the, the siege was lifted in, Mar in September of 1565 and the building of Valletta started in March, merely six months after the siege. In other words, they decided to build the town. And this duality did not only exist at the social level, but it also pervaded the mental and cognitive structures of Maltese society. In other words, what we're talking about is the creation 
of on this little island, very little, very, very small, two different cultural blocks, strictly separated from each other, um, forming two opposing teams, namely the town of the, of the, of the countryside and the suburb, Imdina, in fact, it's got an Arab name, Medina, Imdina, and the suburb of Rabat. We still call it Rabat to this day. As the seat of the countryside, incidentally, the language that the people of the, of the countryside spoke practically was one, which is Maltese nowadays. In the, at the time, if you look at the documents of the time, it was known as Arabico, in Italian, because it was very similar to Arabic. It is a Semitic language, Maltese, so that is the reason why uh, it was known as Arabico. Um, in the harbor area, uh, the official language was Italian. But they also spoke Spanish and French. And the, obviously, the common people spoke some Maltese as well. And there was some Greek roaming about. But official documents were written in Italian. So um, in the harbor area, therefore, Birgu Victor it was named Victoriosa, the victorious city after 1565, and eventually Valletta the seat of the, of, of the herb, uh, harbor area, urbanized harbor area, were the two blocks. So you have Medina, the old country, um, where, where actually the, the capital sort of, of the, of the peasantry, of the traditional society, which continued to speak and the Maltese and, 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 and behave in a certain way. Uh, it's a rural pattern. While the others were um, the urbanized harbor area. So on the one side, there were the typical classes of an agrarian society consisting of landowners, a small class of notaries, priests and clerks, and a mass of peasants. That is what you would find in the, in the countryside. These had their own cultural traditions to which they were very strongly attached, including a language which they spoke every day. On the other side, there were the new town dwellers and other settlers, often in direct employment with the Order of St. John, who were alien, lived in the city, cosmopolitan in their orientation, and with no ancient culture of their own. Yet in the harbor towns, social distinctions prevailed as everywhere else. The, the fundamental difference based on economic affluence. The property owners and the dependent members of the town, such as merchants, artisans, shopkeepers, and professionals, spurned those who were subservient or economically dependent by, a per by virtue of being laborers, apprentices, and servants. The order, in, sh in short, came to represent a concentration of international capital, which coupled to an, in an incredible reserve of human resource, made possible a vast program of urbanization, successfully carried through since the order set foot on Malta in 1530. Even so, it is surprising to realize that it was possible to achieve all this on an island with a population raise of merely 30,000. In other words, the population of Malta and Gozo in 1590, for example, was simply 30,000. Eventually, by uh, 1614, it goes up to 40,000. By the 1660s, it goes up to 60,000. When the Knights leave Malta in 1798, the population is 100,000. Um, it keeps up going up. Nowadays, we are around 470,000 in all, nowadays. Uh, I think there is an overpopulation, because we are, we are talking of an island which, if I were to use miles, it's uh, nine miles wide, 17 miles long, from one tip to the other. So it's a very, 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 very small place. Uh, so with half a million people living on a, in a very small place, I think that if I, were, if I were to compare it, probably I would compare it to Hong Kong or Singapore, something like that, on those lines. Um, <laughs> something on those lines. Uh, it's very small. So the, the creation of a new urban area around the Grand Harbor had effectively revolutionized the human geography of Malta and the life of its people. Nevertheless, after 1565, the emergence of Valletta as the administrative capital of the Maltese islands came to dominate and condition Maltese life. In fact, urban theory recognizes cities to be not merely dense concent con concentrations of people, but above all, concentrations of people doing different things 
where the urban character derives more from that variety of activity than it does from sheer numbers. And that exactly existed in Valletta. There were a lot of people doing different things. A lot of trades, a lot of, a lot of crafts, a lot of different things. So in reality, therefore, to speak of the harbor area, Valletta is the center of administration, is to speak of a conglomeration of four towns. Valletta was the political and economic capital. In the upper part of the city, the Grand Master, the Grand Council, and high society lived and exercised their authority. The common people lived mostly in the lower districts. The three cities of Vittoriosa, known as Bilko before 1565, Senglea, or Isola, as it was known, we still call it Isla, and Cospicua, previously known as Bormla, stood on the south bank of the Grand Harbour. Between them, the four towns had a population of around 10,000. Eventually, it grew to about 30,000 within 100 years from 1590. That is approximately one third of Malta's population, in fact, in 1590. The three cities eventually came to form part of the popular district where they were with Valletta, with their narrow streets packed with foreigners, merchandise, sailors, and slaves. And the slaves are important too. Uh, we had a large population of slaves. These were mainly captured during warring activities. And the grand majority of these slaves were North African Sunni Muslims mainly. But you also found the odd Syrian, uh, uh, Turk, and so on. You also had um, a small community, very small community of Jews who were captured too. Especially because the Jews lived in the, in the Ottoman Empire at the time. This is after Ferdinand and Isabella had literally kicked them out from Spain and its territories. So as a result, the Jews also become, they're still, mem uh, they're still uh, uh, people of the book, but they are considered to be obviously a non-Christian and therefore you can easily capture them. I mean, you're allowed to, I mean, at that, that time, eh? no. <laughs> you could easily capture them. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the same thing, by the way, happened on the other side. The Jews did not do it, but the others did the same to the Christians, especially the best place for the Christian slaves was Algeria, Algiers. Algiers was famous for the Christian slaves. It was packed with Christian slaves. So this was a tit for that. I mean, it was a strange situation, which maybe nowadays we may find it difficult to accept. I hope so, at least. Uh, <laughs> so, Valletta dominated the entire economy of Malta, the political influence of the harbour towns on the countryside, the power of the Grand Master, the, how, the highly concentrated nature of trade, all combined and contributed to the vast development of the harbour area. This growth imposed an order on the area it dominated and established a wealth of administrative and trading connections. By the early 17th century, the harbour zone had not only developed into a very busy area, but it practically handled all Malta's foreign trade and had become a cultural center of some value. The harbour towns were multifunctional and together they performed roles that were essential for the whole society. The creation of an efficient and well-organized bureaucracy was to form the basis for the economic and political dependency of the countryside. Thus, the more technically efficient the harbour towns became, the more they increased the potential dependency of the countryside. The virtual monopoly of Valletta, in fact, over importation of all commodity items and exports, including that of cotton, the major cash crop, enabled the new capital from very early on to control all the production and redistribution within the Maltese Islands. It was, above all, the central sorting station. Whether bound in land or abroad, everything had to filter past through the Valletta Harbour. The harbour town dwellers were well aware of the influence that the state had on their daily existence. The intensification of traffic and trade, the new te technical possibilities of administration, and the economic development of the harbour area are part of the picture of the systematization of authority and the strengthening of the grandmasters, grandmasters the head of the order, political role. So it's important at this point to have a look at the urban culture of Malta. 
the heavy influx into the new urban areas of foreigners and people from the countryside, starting from the 16th century onwards, altered the ethnic character of the population of Malta. The new character, um, sorry. the newcomers may not have brought a distinctive culture of their own, as the case seems to be. Nevertheless, their physical preponderance managed to transform the distinctiveness of the Maltese lifestyle, whose cultural patterns are usually associated with an urban lifestyle, um, even nowadays. After all, what is essential here are not the internal contrasts of urban culture, but its different character from a uh, peasant approach, mainly. So, this give you an idea of an elite house in Malta still like that. Um, this goes back to the time of the knights. It shows you how refined this house is. It's open to the public. One can go and visit this place. It was common for the early modern middle classes to mingle with the ordinary folk because of the ever-growing demographic pressures. Thus, both wealthy Maltese and the knights often occupied sumptuous buildings, while the workers lodged wherever space was available. This is nothing new. Everywhere is like that. The ground floor of these imposing edifices usually contained a stable, stores, and a workshop with an entry from the, chair, from the street, sometimes with displays extending into the street itself. Very often, a number of families had to share the same dwelling in order to be able to pay the rent bill, obviously belonging to the elite or to some knight. Eh? Always the same story. Matrimonial contracts indirectly refer to the shortage of space within the harbor area. Thus, whereas it was normal for peasants to own a normal house, poor house, but at least normal, a house which is detached from everyone else's house in the past, not nowadays, because even in the villages nowadays in Malta, you have people living in flats. Huh? <laughs> to, be, to be clear about that. Maybe... Um, consisting of some rooms at, rooms at ground floor level at the time, it was common for poor artisans to live in one-room cellars in, in the harbor area, whose only means of light and there was the street door. Uh, they were known as me mezzanines, constructed up, um, above them, which were likewise small and ill-ventilated. The, except for the houses of the rich, most elements in the harbor area could pass as cheap housing means. Such an atmosphere made family life rather difficult, and therefore most of the socialization processes took place not in the family, but at public levels. Even when, for example, a man and his wife quarreled, the problem was that the neighbors would know exactly what's happening. So, I mean, uh, there was a lot of gossip going on, a lot of people prying on, it, on, on other people. Uh, it wasn't really, you know, private life did not really exist. So, Urban culture, therefore, did not simply renew or transform earlier cultural practices, but organized them according to fundamentally new principles based on a market economy. They were talking of a market economy in the 16th, 17th centuries. Obviously, city life, independent of class attachments, ethnic identity, and other traditional prejudices, were labeled as alien by the indigenous population, that is the local Maltese, right from the very beginning of the order's rule. Now, the immense surge of activities generated both by the foundation of Valletta and by the Order's presence with its manifold interests made the island one of the busiest centers of the Mediterranean. There is evidence for this. I'm not just uh, making a statement here. The Order of St. John had managed to establish a ruling system which seeped down the social scale and gave character to the harbor area. Incidentally, this was possible for a very simple reason. These came from the best Obviously, they were Catholic, Roman Catholics, not just, you know, um, and therefore, but they were very rich. They were some of the best families in Europe. As a result, they had a real lot of money and power. And with that money, they did a lot of fantastic things. For example, you could find someone who decides to build a fortress. And he pays the salaries of the soldiers at that fortress, including all the equipment, I'm talking guns, muskets, everything. Uh, another, another one would set up a, a new galley. A galley, to give you an idea, had between 500 to 600 men on board, living next to each other. Yeah? 
Just imagine, you have to pay the salaries, the equipment, everything, food. And this guy is paying out of his own pocket. Nowadays, I don't think any politician would imagine doing that. But in those times, it was quite common. And this is before the French Revolution, of course. Um, with the French Revolution, you couldn't pinpoint a particular person as they would at that time. So these are, you know, they were different, very different. So what can we say about this? Well, basically, the order um, had managed to do a lot of things which, for example, uh, as we have said, seeped down the social scale and gave character to the harbor area. But these dominant cultural patterns failed to infiltrate the entire structure of peasant society. And this is very interesting. Uh, there are many people who actually comment on Malta, traveling to Malta in the 16th century, in the, 15th, in the 17th century, and especially, and especially in the 18th. And one of them is an Englishman. This was m much before the British actually became, uh, you know, we, Malta became a colony of Britain. This is about 150 years before. And this man, Philip Skippin, writing in 1664, could visibly distinguish city dwellers from villagers. He sums up the situation by, not, by, by noting that while most city dwellers speak Italian well, the natives of the countryside, this is how he called them, natives, speak a kind of Arabic, Maltese in other words. The Maltese historian, recently, who just passed away recently, Gottfried Wettinger tends to agree with Skippin's view. He argues, for example, that gradually the townspeople became largely indistinguishable in outlook from the inhabitants of other towns in southern Europe. In the countryside, however, old forms of cooking, gold musical instruments, much of the old types of houses remained very much in use. There they still repeated the same old Maltese proverbs, where the land in largely the same old way, hunted and held homely festivals. Um, in other words, they, they did not change much, uh, the villagers. In practice, however, uh, the great tradition certainly influenced village life, or the little tradition, that went on to absorb and adopt elements of city life in a way to make it its own. Um, one important aspect which um, needs to be mentioned here is the architectural boom which spilled from the new city into the surrounding countryside so that by the early 17th century the parish churches of larger villages like for example the village of Birkirkara and smaller ones like Balzan Lia Attar they are next to each other these three could boast of a parish church that was built on a magnificent scale probably however the cathedral church which is this one here at Imdina at the old town is the best example Thus, one could say that urban culture possessed such a great integrating force that despite the fact, in other words, that the peasants remained detached, uh, it quickly achieved um, hegemony. It was able to create a mode of behavior and a way of life largely acceptable to the whole society. The political centrality of the city underlined its cultural magnetism. Functioning as an administrative capital, Valletta broadcasted the fashions and values of the Grand Master's court. Ideas and styles, fashions, manners and habits, artists, architects and Belgian tapestries too, were all imported from trading Europe and paid for by the order's accumulative capital. Accumulating capital, sorry. It attracted litigants to its law courts. These were the law courts of the knights. Nowadays, it's the Ministry for Health. Um, but that is the law court of the knights. Um, and passed on the government's proclamations to the rest of the island. In the economic field, the city became the harbinger of modernity with markets that were as much a meeting place for social uh, relations as they were for business transactions. Valletta, like any other early modern European capital, was the, hub, uh, was the powerhouse of cultural change. The dissemination of artistic and cultural influence, information, and news reached the Maltese countryside. Together with the other towns of the harbor area, it monopolized the economic and administrative resources of the new state. Concluding remarks, thus a city which was originally conceived as a convent, 
literally as a convent, officially of this order of monk, warrior monks, and fortified Tengle for the defense against possible Ottoman attack, obviously by a monastic military order, was transformed into a central Mediterranean hub of complex trading networks, intense commercial activity, and movement of people that resulted in the widest possible cultural diversity. Thank you. Thank you.